Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ICD session at the Eden uh, uh, Learning Week. I'm very happy to, uh, to have you here to uh, welcome you to the multi uh, workshop on multisectoral collaboration, discussing development and adaptation to ensure quality, open, flexible, and distance learning. Thank you, Eden, for inviting us to the, to the Learning Week. And uh, congratulations again for the Prize of Excellence, uh, ICD Prize of Excellence, that uh, you've uh, uh, very uh, well earned uh, uh, this year, 2021st uh, uh, Prize of Excellence for Eden. My name is Anaïs Rudmalbran. Um, I'm the senior advisor at ICDE, and I'm also uh, the coordinator for the Francophone OER project, which we'll talk about uh, later in this session. I uh, also um, work with the membership and uh, governance at ICDE. So those of you who are members of ICDE have probably been in contact with me as well. Um, I'll be moderating the workshop today. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, that uh, you are uh, numerous uh, participants uh, uh, today. Um, uh, first, a uh, little uh, housekeeping. So as you've seen, the um, session is recorded. Uh, Eden will uh, the data secretary will, will keep the recordings and I can share with, with you later. Uh, this session is scheduled for 90 minutes. Um, and um, if you don't want to be recorded, then just let uh, your microphone and camera off. So then you won't be uh, in, the, in the recordings. Um, this workshop has come together as a... Um, a response to an increasing need to build strong multi-sectoral relationships. Uh, we've seen it through our uh, partnerships, our project, uh, uh, the project we've been working in, developing, uh, including the ICD community. And we thought that this could be a good way to, to showcase this important collaboration. Um, as an actor uh, global uh, within open, flexible, and distance learning, ICD now more than ever, uh, see the need to strengthen ties and collaboration between sectors uh, such as higher education, the private sector, government bodies, and others. And the tech sector is a major player within education, uh, without whom many of our new commonly used tools and methods in education would not exist. Many will often question the alignment of interests between sectors, especially those of private sectors and NGOs, for instance, but we feel it's time to let this go. Um, today, we'll discuss learn, and learn more about the potential, the immense opportunities, specific needs to achieve larger goals, and specifically in achieving the um, Sustainable Development Goal number four uh, on quality education, and the number 17 on partnerships, the, the UN um, Sustainable Goals. Um, and in an increasingly connected world with increasing opportunities for development and impact, we will hear from two ICD projects who are using multi-sectoral collaboration as a key strategy for success. We have invited Jacques Dong, the secretary of the French Digital University, Université Numérique. He is a devoted OER enthusiast. Um, for several year, years as the Secretary of ONEJ as well, which is a French thematic digital university in economics and management, as the Secretary of the French Digital University and as a member of the Digital Accreditation Committee of Conference des Grandes Écoles, he has devoted himself to developing partnerships of French higher education with European higher education institutions and major player in open education, such as ICDE, but also Open Education Global, and the um, OER Foundation, Jack is very connected in the open education, and he's also the co-facilitator of the Francophone OER Expert Group, uh, which you will learn more about today. The second panelist is Alan Nesson, Strategic Customer Success Manager at Instructor Global Limited. He's currently, he currently supports large and complex institutions to maximize value and educational, organizational impact for their ed tech investments. Previous to this role, he led the e-learning team at the University of Ulster, where he also delivered a number of UK national projects in the areas of LMS, library integration, learning design models, 
and approaches to promote curriculum innovation. He is also part of the Encore Plus team, the second project you'll learn about today, coordinated by ICD. He provides expert insights from a private sector perspective in the Encore OER ecosystem project. And the third and final panelist is our very own Ebalosa Nielsen, also very linked to Eden. Uh, he's a newly, she's a newly re-elected ICD board member. We're very happy about that. She's the chair of the OER Advocacy Committee and a global expert on OER. She has served in a variety of boards uh, and has a long list of published articles and a very is a very active participant in the OER community. So welcome to all our speakers, panelists, participants. The session today will consist of a presentation from the two invited speakers, Shakdan and Alan Masson. And after this, we will have an open floor for Q&A. We ask you to send your questions through the uh, chat or just raise your hands and directly connect with the, with the panelists and speakers. And we'll then move to the panel discussion, after which we will also have a Q&A session so that you can exchange on the specific uh, discussion within the panel. And we'll um, finish just with closing words. So please feel free, if you've done that already, to introduce yourself in the chat. And um, we'll start just now with a short introduction of ICD, and then I'll let the speakers talk. So I'll just share my screen very quickly. Let's see. Can you see it well? Now, so uh, for those of you who don't know ICD yet, um, this is just about the participants, but now we've introduced them. Um, ICD is a very old organization. We've been created in 1938, so we've been here uh, far away. Um, it's a global non-for-profit NGO and also a membership association. We are hosted and partly funded by Norway since 1988, and we are in formal consultative partnership with UNESCO. The vision of ICD in our latest strategic plan for 2021-2024 is to achieve the potential of open, flexible, and distance learning created through our members and learning communities. We have a global outreach, so we have more than 300 members across uh, the world, touch more than 70 countries in all of our regions. And it's estimated that our members impact over than 15 million students across the continents. We have OER as a strategic priority in the last strategic plan, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, we have um, three main actors within the OER community, which is the OER Advocacy Committee, which is chaired by Valsen Nielsen, the ICD uh, Francophone OER Project, which uh, Yasmin Rik and UNESCO are key partners, and that Jack will present to you later, and Encore Plus, which is financed by the European Union, and which uh, Alain Masson will um, talk about later in this session. We uh, are a very small secretariat, <laughs> very few people, so we need our community to achieve our goals. And that's the strength of ICD, really. We work with members, with partners who are institutions, um, higher education institutions, uh, also in the um, uh, private sector, individuals, experts, faculty to students, associations like Eden, a key partner, uh, regional, but also global institutions, um, global associations. And we work at different levels, uh, policy, mainly with UNESCO, but also Commonwealth of Learning, for instance, and other IGOs. We work with advocacy and leadership. So our members, uh, we are directly connected with the leaders and, and with our partners. We also work at the very leader uh, level, but at other levels too, with the students, with some individual experts. And we also um, keep sharing knowledge and good practice of open, flexible, and distance education with expert members, partners, so through events, uh, webinars, uh, publications, journal. I mean, we, we are constantly connected and, and sharing. So 
the global diversity broadens our perspective. That's that's really the strength of ICD, the, the global aspect of it. The personal connections, um, the collaborative opportunities across borders and sectors that we keep um, building, that we keep finding, and, and that's something also that keeps the, the community alive. And the increased impact. So, of course, we join forces, the advocacy campaign, through the leadership that, that gives impact of, of the activities that we, we take. And we learn through sharing expertise practice all the time. You're very welcome to join the community. You can become a member, of course, uh, individual, student, or institution. I will share this PowerPoint, so then you will have the link to directly subscribe to the newsletter to become a member. You can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, on our blog, and also through our journal Open Praxis, which you can read, but you can also uh, participate. There is a call for articles uh, every four times a year. Uh, our editor can select and the editorial board uh, selects it. So also check it out and uh, feel free to uh, respond to the calls. You can reach us at the general secretary email address or directly uh, at uh, my email. Uh, so now I will give the floor to Jacques Dong uh, so that he can present you the Francophone OER project. Check your microphone is on mute. Mm. We can't hear you. Mm. And I think everyone else, if it's possible, if everyone else can mute their microphone, that will also be helpful. Thank you. Jack, do you hear us? I'm sorry, can, can no. you? Yeah, can, now I hear you. Can Perfect. you hear me? But uh, I can't seem to have the control of my presentation. Oh, that. okay. Do you want me to share it for you? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, yeah. So, so we can just stop sharing and I'll, I'll open it. Um, let's see. need to open it first. Sorry, it's always a few. Now, there, do you see it? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anais, and my apologies to all of you. I have uh, uh, I haven't activated my video because today my uh, broadband network is not so good. So thank you everyone for being here. So this is uh, I'll be talking about uh, a multi-sectoral approach for strategy for OER in a specific area of the globe. So multi-sectoral has several meanings. So in this presentation, I will focus on the public sector and on the government level, as well as on the higher education university level. And I will also focus on a specific area of the world, which is Francophone countries in West Central East Africa. So what I will be saying is definitely not applicable to a country that is completely different, such as the US with a completely different approach. So the Université Numérique, the French Digital University, is uh, federates six areas, systematic areas, business, economics, healthcare, and sports, science, technology, humanities, and sustainable development. Next slide. 
So we are involved in a number of international partnerships, the most two most important ones being, of course, ICDE uh, and the UNESCO Dynamic Coalition. But we are also, to one of our thematic areas, members of EDEN. And we also involved in uh, many conferences. These are the ones we've been participating this year in. And we're also involved in a number of European Union funded projects around themes like uh, virtual mobility, mutual recognition agreements, and uh, also digital credentials. So moving on to the next slide, we have a number of uh, partnerships with uh, French-speaking countries in Africa, 13 of them, uh, out of about 24, so about half of them. We are sharing uh, resources with them. We are setting up emergency pandemic platforms for higher education, as in Congo. And we also cooperate with uh, traditional universities in Senegal and in Togo. So we have a range of uh, partnerships which are very diverse with these different countries. Moving on to the next slide. Thanks to ICDE, we have launched, uh, we have participated in the launch of the ICDE Francophone OER project uh, with the Open Education Leadership Summit in 2018 in Paris, and our first face-to-face uh, -face meeting about 18 months ago in Paris. So we are grouping a number of institutions that we can see on the next slide, which are traditional universities, uh, virtual universities, international NGOs such as uh, ICDE, Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, and with uh, very strong support from the French partner, the Digital University, the Ministry of Higher Education and Research, the French National Commission, and the French, uh, uh, sorry, the French <coughs> at the University of Nantes. So on the next slide, these are the four main areas of action to the OER uh, recommendation by UNESCO, with a strong focus by ICDE on capacity building and supportive policies. So I'll be talking a little bit more about these two areas. In the next slide, we will see that uh, we will one uh, initiative in uh, capacity building. It's about adapting a course on copyright, IPR, and Creative Commons licenses that was developed by the uh, OERU uh, network in New Zealand. And it is a course that is offered to the global community for free. So we had a course translated by extremely good linguists at UNESCO. We managed the technical adaptation in the francophone context. And very importantly, we also managed the integration of a civil law approach in addition to the common law approach. So in the next slide, we'll see why that uh, integration is important, because in the next slide, you can see the distribution of civil law and common law systems. Not all are very uh, homogeneous, but you can see that in blue, the civil law countries represent a number of countries, whereas the common law countries in pink also represent a large part of the developed world. So moving on to the next slide, uh, there are differences in civil law and common law. The civil law approaches focuses on intellectual property rights, which is a perspective based on the author, whereas copyright in common law focuses more on the work that you can or not reproduce. Overall, these two approaches are very compatible. There are a few limitations. One of them is very important. A Creative Commons license is something that is non-revocable. On the other hand, the moral right of an author is also something that, that cannot be revoked. So, uh, through this course, we had to adapt uh, to the continent-wide Africa, the regional uh, adaptations and uh, uh, in specific countries. And also conflict resolution is also different in civil law systems and in common law systems. In civil law, you have a rigid hierarchy of norms which make conflict resolution straightforward and involves simple and nullification from uh, one level to the other. 
Moving on to the next slide, we have learned a number of lessons. We have learned that it's important that we have an extremely good linguistic adaptation, and uh, especially on things that seem to be the similar, which are completely different, which is IPR, or society on the one hand, and copyright on the other hand. Cultural adaptation is also extremely important, technology, and we have to be at the very high level in the generic legal, legal systems, but we also have to address regional and national frameworks and how we can reward, uh, how we can account for the time spent by individual teachers and with respect to statutes of civil servants. And finally, what we have learned that it's a very enthusiastic uh, process and that we are envisioning extending to other languages, mainly Portuguese in uh, Africa. Moving on to the next slide, we uh, are seeing that uh, we have a first session of the course, which will be held from November 17th to the end of the month with a, a facilitator. So it's a synchronous session, uh, the first one of them that will be held this course will be facilitated by the University of uh, Virtual University of Senegal, and it can bring you the people who register a uh, digital badge uh, rewarding the competency, uh, your competency in copyright, IPR, and Creative Commons licensing. So I think that whoever is interested, you can register on the link which is on the slide and which will be made available to the Eden Secretariat. Moving on to the next slide, we see that in all these conferences, in all these webinars, we have a multidisciplinary approach in the high education institutions. We have academics, we have researchers, we have librarians, people coming from the audio video world and from the IT departments. But I would like to mention that we don't see so much people from norms and standards, from bodies such as IMS, CN, CN Workshop, or the SC36 committee at ISO IEC on learning technologies. This reflects what is done in higher education. In government departments, it's quite different. There is actually no multidisciplinary approach as we can see in the next slide. We can see that uh, there is sometimes a collaboration between uh, education, K-12 and higher education. Sometimes, but not enough between the uh, education and labor and professional training ministries, because we are dealing with issues important such as competencies, skills, national qualification frameworks. We also have a wide diversity of ministries that have special training institutions, which are in charge of infrastructure. And we also have ministries that are in charge with things like copyright, IPR licenses justice and culture, and also ministries that deal with the World Trade Organization and the World International Property Organization. And I haven't seen, even in France, any academic willing to deal with the French representatives in these international bodies. And of course, the edtech sec ed -tech sector, but our colleague uh, will, from Uncomplus Project will be talking about the uh, viewpoint from the private sector. So moving on to the next slide, we also have uh, an approach. We can see that the national general interest can be multifaceted. Of course, we support the free and open source software in higher education in France. We have a JITSI that has developed uh, uh, an open source software for video conferencing. But we also have a proprietary system, Katia, for the airspace industry that involves 16,000 people, 16,000 employees around the world. So we have to uh, take these, multi these two facets into account. At the same time, from the cultural ministry, we protect uh, works of art to restrict licensing. But on the other hand, these protection make it difficult for, my, for our colleagues from uh, the UNESCO chair on OER to, to do data mining on uh, these uh, uh, intellectual works. So these are two different approaches that we must combine when we're speaking of national strategy. So moving on to the next slide, uh, we can see that specific issues of the higher education sector in these countries, they are very centralized and they have national tenure track systems, national degrees. So we have the need for a coherent multi-sectoral government approach. 
Moving on to the next slide, we can see also specifics of the OER landscape in these countries. There are not so many OER in French, so we need to have a good, uh, to ensure the availability of OER, the sustainability and the long-term content relevance. I discussed about the legal context, and we these reasons make it necessary for us to build a lasting and trusting relationship with the authors, while at the same time having the coexistence of open education and government-sponsored and commercial initiatives. So the moving on to the next slide, the main areas for work for multi-sectoral approach from the public sector is we need to work on the infrastructure, of course, the legal framework, the administrative framework, recognition and qualification frameworks. All these are baby steps at the national level with a top-down approach, but a top-down approach which is compatible with uh, the specifics of these countries. We also need to work, on the other hand, with the harmonization at the regional level. We need to learn to work on the bottom-up approach or horizontal approach with individual educators and learners. And so the next step in our view for capacity building is setting up a leadership school for decision makers in public organization involving civil servants, governing bodies of higher education institutions and heads of teaching and research departments. So these are the next steps uh, that we are envisioning for, uh, for capacity building in cooperation with ICD and UNESCO. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jack. I will stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, I'll, uh, I mean, if you have already questions, you can um, uh, have them in the chat. Uh, this is a message to participants. I'll move on to the next presentation and, and we can take a QA uh, at the end of, of both. So uh, keep your questions or publish them in the chat and, and we'll take that moment after the second presentation. So, Alan, please, the floor is yours. Your microphone, Alan. I was just checking if everybody could hear me then I realized my microphone was off. Uh, let me just go back a slide. So good afternoon, everybody. So I next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to share uh, some information around the Encore Plus project. It really is designed to be a multi-sectoral collaboration to kind of look at some of the challenges around OER. So uh, I'm part of the consortium membership of it. So I'm here to share both information about the project and also what we see as the key challenges. So just to give an idea of the agenda, introduction to the project, who we are. Key thing is why are we doing it? What's the key challenges we're trying to address? What's the approach we're trying to address? How we build in multi-sector perspectives into the approach? And what do we hope to achieve? And then finally, just to set up some conversation for later on, what are some of the challenges we're seeing from, from the canvas and structure perspective? Okay, so Encore Plus, there's the URL for it. I'll share that in the chat in just a minute. Okay, so it's basically funded by the European Commission under Erasmus Plus, and it's really trying to support the uptake, increase the uptake of open educational resources. And it's also about trying to catalyze and share innovative practice so that we can start to build momentum around how things, how things are done. Final thing is, it's really about building stakeholder communities in order to build up the knowledge exchange so we can move things forward as well. So those are the kind of three pillars underneath the project. <clears throat> Who are we? Why we're in the group will become evident later on, but the key thing to highlight is <clears throat> it's, a, it's a strong blend of universities that have a strong uh, track record in working with OERs and researching about OERs, and also some vendors and corporate perspectives on things. So Instructure is my, my employer. We also have Jubo in Norway. So we have, we're a good mix of people who are in, in the business of trying to utilize, promote, and deliver OERs to end users. 
Okay. So it's, it's a project, but what's the challenge it's trying to address? Well, it's a number of key challenges. The, the highest one is there's a fragmented uh, approach to OERs. They're, they're hosted everywhere. It's hard to map where they're at. And it's quite frankly, quite hard to find what you're looking for if you're a busy academic trainer or facilitator. So to kind of unpick that defragmentation, we've kind of identified some supporting challenges. One is... How do we support strategies to, to actually promote and uh, embed a culture of OER usage? Second one is, how do we build quality paradigms and assurance mechanisms so that people have confidence in what resources are there, why they're there, the relevance to people? Next is, what are the interoperability challenges? What are the technical challenges around connecting things up so that we can get a good pipeline of resources going into OERs, but also a good pipeline of usage and awareness of end users without having to invest too much time in learning about the OER frameworks? And then the final challenge is, how do we create conversations so that people can start to bring in innovative approaches and business models to actually better use OERs? So those are the key challenges space that we see the project trying to address. And our kind of approach is to kind of map those to some common themes. So we've kind of baked it down into four key areas, policies and practice, quality, technology, and innovation and business models. So that gives us what we feel are natural conversation hubs, which pick up the conversations around those key challenges. So what we hope to do is, this is a way of crowdsourcing how to bring together best practices that work and identify innovative practices in these areas to move forward. And what we're trying to take is a circle strand of communication hubs to share best practices and learn new things and bake them around these areas of policy practice, quality, technology, and innovation and business models. So our method, how are we trying to do this? So first of all is establishing these thematic circle communities and starting to create a way of building these communities up and having events to have these things starting to share, uh, share innovation practices and ideas. And those are going to act as hubs for innovation so we can capture things and share things. And hopefully what we will do is start to enhance the educational ecosystem through findings, recommendations and networks that we build from these interactions that were taking place just now. As you can see, we've got the four circles. Uh, first of all, on the, on the policy and strategy, it's really looking at what are the institutional strategies? What, how are institutions looking to use them? What's the things that are promoting them? Who are the key actors and driving change? Quality circles, what are we doing around quality paradigms? How, how do we actually how do we escalate things and share things? And what basis do people understand why they can use things and on what basis. Technology circle, yes, let's get some technology demonstrators, but really talk about what changes need to take place in the standards to help these things work better. And finally, that innovation hub around innovation. Where are there opportunities to do things differently, to drive things from different perspectives? So what would we like to achieve in three years' time at the end of the project? I think the first thing is there's a lot of interest in practice that works at a micro level. So it's really identifying what actually works in organizations and sharing those out. There are challenges on the tech side in particular, how to actually cross search and surface stuff to end users. So a lot of the things around getting a new vision around where the tech infrastructure and standards need to be adapted and promoted starting to build open, distributed, and trusted quality review strategies and searchable strategies so that when things are shared, they can be easily found by end users. And if we can do that, we're working towards a more transparent, in particular, EU open educational resource ecosystem. 
And the underpinning things that we want to try and do with that is if we do get those things in place, it starts to generate a bit of an innovation conversation in the area. And also we can start to generate fresh approaches and ideas, which hopefully builds up some entrepreneurs and startup scenes around trying to use these things. So that's where we hope to get to in three years. Where are we just now? Well, the good news is we're in the early stages of the project. We've just launched our first circle events and starting to establish the circles. So now is a good time to join the conversation, share the best practices, influence the project with your ideas, challenges, and where we can go next. So this is a perfect time to share what we're doing with people like yourselves. Okay. Instructure is an LMS vendor. We actually provide solutions to higher education, K-12, to uh, training organizations, NGOs, and voluntary sector. So we really are an end user where people can create courses in order to deliver. So OERs is something that people want to use in their courses. And as a vendor that provides that, we see a couple of big challenges. One is when people go looking for something, it's very fragmented. How do you find OERs to build into your course? So who actually maps out the space and how can people discern which resources out there are are right for them, both in terms of legal opportunity to use, cultural context and curriculum alignment. And then the second bucket of work is, it's interesting to do that, but how do we need to work on a standards base so these things are scalable across multiple systems? Because if we don't help teachers find things naturally, we really have to rely on teachers being OER aware, and they have to be able to find and embed content, content themselves. And that's going to be a challenge and continue the current low awareness and adoption. So that's a very brief 10-minute guide to the project. Uh, for more information, uh, www.encoreproject.org. EU is the place to go. You can learn more information about things and sign up to the Circle events and keep up to date and join us when we're doing things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jacques. Um, I'll now open the floor for questions. I have a few myself. I don't know if anyone from the public has an immediate question to the speakers. I've seen just like questions about um, yeah more the um, like presentation. So I like just just didn't secretary I'd answer that on the chat. Uh, but then I'll just ask myself maybe just one question to Jacques first, and then to Alan. Uh, Jacques, in the collaboration with the other stakeholders, uh, not the sectoral collaboration you've been involved in, what would you say is the biggest lesson learned, uh, what any unforeseen surprises or unforeseen benefits you've encountered in, in your experience? Well, um, thank you, Anaïsa. Uh, very pragmatic lessons. There's no superiority in a top-down versus a bottom-up or a horizontal approach. We need to listen to all players. We need to understand them. That's one thing. But then, at some point in time, in a specific ecosystem, and I'm talking about the specific Franco-African ecosystem, which is hierarchical, which is civil law, which is in French, we need to take decisions. Uh, I would say that having worked at the European level, as in the Encore Plus project, the dynamics there are more about cooperation, about sharing, but it's also about listening and about understanding what the various stakeholders would like to have. So listening, uh, taking a decision, and also having a roadmap, because there are things that you can do in the short term, there are things you can do in the medium term, and you can't do them all. But what I have learned a lot about past years, especially from working with the ICD partners and working with UNESCO and everyone, is that listening to all the people and working together with them is extremely important. So it's a very 
it's not a very uh, rich or very unusual or very enlightening answer, but it's one that comes from a, a lot of experience and thankfully a lot of good experience with UNESCO and ICD. Thank you, Jacques. Very interesting answer <laughs> and uh, food for thought. <laughs> Alan, maybe for you, uh, uh, maybe a bit provocative one, I don't know, you'll tell me. <laughs> Is um, OER still mostly for enthusiasts? Uh, is it easy to reach out to relevant uh, stakeholders outside of the more narrow OER enthusiasts? Because the uncomplice with the circles, I mean, the idea is really to, to gather, to get people to think together. What's I, your point? Of, like, so I, I think yeah. the most interesting thing share is, so I, I've been involved in things like repository projects and everything for going back maybe 15 years. And the project was prepared before pre-COVID. But when we started, the project was post-COVID. And I think what was really surprising was that the cultural context around OERs was actually totally different from what the project was intended around. Uh, I think there was an expectation of we were trying to push, push a big rolling stone up a hill. We we're trying to get more coordination. But actually, COVID brought a huge expectation and demand from end users to say, where is the content we want to use? We want to share content with others, but there's content we want to share with anybody, and how can we find this stuff? So there's actually a big demand pool coming from all sectors around, how can we do this better because we want to do it? So we kind of feel the project is actually super timely just now because there is an appetite for change. But what the project's also very cognizant of is, it's all quite joined up. As Jacques kind of said, it's not just a question of showing people what they can use. It's what's culturally relevant, what's in language, what is what are they allowed to use under certain things. So things like the quality perspective, as well as the um, um, policy perspective of who curates this and how do we trust what's going on, those are the things that can make things happen easily. Because ultimately, the problem space is busy people are trying to find something useful for them, and how do we make it easy? Thank you, Adam. Very, very interesting. I see that we have now a, a question from uh, M. Joao uh, in the chat for Jacques. Um, what are the Portuguese speaking countries involved in the project. Uh, I collaborate with the Angolian institution for several years that are beginning to define their ICT strategies. Certainly, it would be important to follow, be involved in the project. What are the possibilities? Uh, well, we're definitely very much interested in the Portuguese uh, language because we have uh, partnerships with people in uh, Mozambique and Angola as well as a net tech company in uh, Portugal. And of course, uh, ICD was supposed to host uh, the, their conference in Natal uh, with uh, uh, last year. So we believe that there is a strong need for non-English and non-Mandarin languages to uh, develop their own ecosystem. So uh, Capacity building is an important issue, and uh, we're willing to expand resources to give, uh, to share our lessons learned, and to work with ICD and UNESCO to uh, adapt uh, the course uh, we have developed for France, uh, French language, to also the Portuguese language. If we were not uh, working with Africa, Spanish would be a more natural choice, but uh, we have uh, partners in Africa, in uh, Portuguese speaking countries, as well in Brazil. So that would be our language of choice to invest in for the next uh, project. Thank you, Jack. I um, published the link of the project on the chat and I'll, I'll share also again the link uh, to the um, um, the course to register interest. I, um, I'll, I'll share it um, during the panel session. Um, if there is no more questions from the public, maybe we can actually move on to the panel session and then introduce Eva also to the floor. Eva Nielsen, welcome Eva. Uh, 
Thank you. Mm, I'll then start uh, with you on the first question, maybe uh, for the for the final discussion to to give you the floor and to give you the chance to to start with the discussion too. Um, how much uh, do you think? Let's see. Uh, sorry. <laughs> What can be done in terms of multisectoral collaboration to help busy people and different audience find OER resources that meet educational goals and subject and cultural context required more quickly and effectively you know, from, from your point of view? Um, yes, uh, thank you. That is a quite hard question to, to answer because I think there is no, not just one solution uh, for that. Um, as we have heard already uh, from the speakers, uh, there's no one size fits all, and uh, we really need to listen to those who, um, to the individuals and the learners and the one the, the end users. But uh, I totally agree that it is uh, quite difficult to find and to um, find um, uh, proper um, OERs uh, out there. Uh, so that is also one reason why we maybe have more production than we actually need. It is um, not so much about um, um, refining or adapt, readapting or recontextualize and this kind of issues to all the other five R's, which are uh, al along with OER. So I think that has been much more um, to be done on that sector, but I don't have the answer really to do it more than, um, but I think that the Ancor Plus project um, um, will give us uh, some um, some solutions and some tools because how to find different kind of ways where to find and how to share and how to also network around um, uh, resources is important. And um, maybe one thing also about um, along to this uh, question is that uh, I really would like more collaboration with the learners and the students in uh, collaborating with uh, both use and reuse and adapt of, or adapting of OER. Um, and also, of course, to work more with, uh, with other um, entities and, and networks. Uh, and I think the real challenge um, with, with OER is to move outside, outside the classroom, outside the course, and outside the, the institution to really uh, reach the, the end users, because uh, the lifelong learners, I mean, in that way, that respect, because um, OER is about human rights and social justice for everyone, not just those uh, exclu exclusive people who can afford to go to some kind of um, formal institution. I would much more see, see uh, OER use in informal and um, informal settings. I can stop there. Thank you, Eva. Yes, I mean it's. Uh, I mean now we've, we've we've heard about the project, and it's true that it's also your perspective gives us um, more inputs from from the other kind of collaboration from the the advocacy committee that you're chairing. It's trying to look into really the benefits of the collaboration within OER. We also I forgot to mention it at the beginning, but ICD is also very much involved in the World Dynamic Coalition. A network of open orgs. So there's different networks in which we evolve and which you're also very involved, Eva. And, and the University of the also is part of the dynamic coalition. So this is kind of the universe uh, of experts that we evolve, but there's also this need to involve more actors. And that's, that's what we discussed today, the multi-sectoral collaboration within the project, but also yeah. within the different groups in which... Uh, uh, maybe I can just we... mention for the for the audience, uh, those who may be not so familiar with the OER Advocacy Committee, we are, as Anais was saying in the beginning, a uh, committee now for the third year, and we work along with the um, ICD uh, strategy, strategy plan, of course, and also uh, all the work with um, with the other networks on uh, on the, those issues. And we have ambassadors from all regions of the world. So of course there is this, uh, we also as ambassadors work with different kinds of stakeholders for the multi multi-sectoral sectors. So that is of course important, but it is not just, um, uh, well, uh, uh, saying like that, uh, uh, nothing will happen without people. Uh, and uh, it is needed with the uh, people sharing and uh, communicate and uh, advocate, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, there need also be some kind of formal uh, formal instrument or tools or ways. Uh, but in the end of the day, it is very much about people, 
how we we advocate about it and how we we share our resources and how we share the the importance of open education and, uh, and OER and not at least here, along to the OER recommendation because that is really the tool we have uh, and I think that is important when, every time when we talk about OER that we align it to the OER recommendation and also now the forthcoming um, recommendation on open science of course because they are also uh, linked to each other. Thank you. Indeed, thank you, Eva. And, and also, it's worth mentioning also for, for uh, the map. Um, so, Encore Plus is, is a European uh, collaboration, uh, but that aims, that has a global aim to collaborate with, with people outside Europe, but it's a European uh, network. For, um, the Francophone group is Francophone speaking countries, so France, um, African countries, mainly Senegal, Congo, and Mali, but also now we've included uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, and many other Francophone countries. And we're in contact with New Zealand also through the course. And the OERAC, uh, the OER Advocacy Committee of ICD, is global, so representative from every region of the world um, and uh, the dynamic coalition as well. Uh, so it's also so that you see like the strength, and as Eva said, as I think all the speakers said today, the, the, the strength is the collaboration, the people behind the collaboration and, and the, the uh, knowledge that each uh, other's experience, uh, each other environment can learn uh, to the other partners. I have another question maybe to all now. I just let you <laughs> react uh, as you wish. Uh, because it's kind of an open question. I think all of you could actually give us a very interesting um, point uh, and your, your very interesting point of view on the matter. And it's about uh, the standards. Uh, what accommodation in standards do we need to think about to allow OERs to be best integrated across the widest learning and development spectrum uh, use uh, for cases and systems? So. I mean, Jack mentioned the legal aspect, uh, so that, that's one standard, but I'll let you uh, react on this. I'll, I'll go first in this one. I, I think there, there are some parts of the framing are actually quite good. So you, things like Creative Commons can provide a good reasonable set of framework around on what basis is it being shared? How can people use it? And there's some, some tra tracing of where it's come from. I think when you look at why people choose things, be it a busy student or be it a busy member of staff, I think they, they tend to look for reassurance that it's, it's good for them. And, and I think when you look at research communities separate from teaching communities, it's peer recognition. I think if you're, a, if you're an academic creating a new uh, course for reading lists, you tend to look at reading lists of similar courses. So, you, so you're looking for that peer recognition. And I think one of the challenges around repositories is how do, how do we get that peer recommendation, peer understanding of who's been using it, where it's been used before? Because I think in other types of learning assets, that's surfaced a bit easier. Your research community is published somewhere so you can get that network. But can we get that reassurance of where it's been used so people can find things relative to them quicker? I think the other thing is building sustainable upwards. So we, we have a content management system in our system, which allows sharing. So you create a course in your own course, you can share it with your own courses, but you can share it with colleagues or your school or your institution, or maybe you're in a consortium with the University of X and you can share that with that university. But that's people creating a resource find it useful, share it with people on a structured basis. Where they hit a bit of a problem is, well, I want to share it with everybody. So where does it go and how do I make that known? So I think it's having natural pipelines up into repositories and having that discovery tool of how to find things. Uh, I would like to share a memory. I was uh, a few years ago, I was in Genoa in Italy at Eden Conference. Um, speaking with practitioners and researchers. And then I took a, fl a flight back to Paris and, back, and then moved on to Busan in South Korea for the ISO 36 uh, uh, subcommittee on learning technologies. Well, the people were talking about the same thing, but they were saying very different things. They were, could not be understood from one side or the audience to the other. 
I think that perhaps listening to both sides would be useful. Understanding also that, uh, uh, well, norms and standards mean different things to people. In our free open source software, we move on fast. Moodle is the standard. H5P is an upcoming standard. Well, ISO and IMS is in the business of selling standards, document standards. ISO is in in another different world with IETF. And there we can see battles between the Koreans, the Japanese, and the Chinese about the future of industry standards. But industry standards are not widely adopted yet. So uh, I think standards, norms, uh, as opposed to what they may be in the engineering sector today, they are good guidelines. They're inspirational. Uh, they're not really uh, uh, strong, rigid standards to which you must adhere. On the other hand, understanding why people work in such a way at ISO or at IMS or at the same workshop in Europe can be enlightening. And also seeing how people bypass these standards at Jubel, at Moodle, is also quite interesting. Uh, I may like um, uh, to continue. If, have, have you finished, uh, Jacques? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I would like to continue on this track. Um, uh, I work a lot on quality development and quality enhancement as well. And everyone is talking what is quality and what is standard and what is that and that. Sometimes I think it is really difficult, for, uh, exactly as you, as you are saying, standard, first of all, standard, the word standard means so different uh, things around the globe. Uh, so maybe we're not actually talking about the same kind of things when we're talking about standards. And then also, um, um, as I also said myself before, you you also said, Shaq, that there are different kind of maybe guidelines or frameworks. We have the, the Creative Commons, for example. We have the, uh, now we have the uh, OER recommendation and all the dimensions within that. And we have um, um, the five R, and I would like to maybe add uh, two more R's, and that is about recognition. How do we really recognize um, uh, staff and people using and also produce or maybe advocate about it? I mean, that is not a standard, so to say, nowadays, how, because that is not, not done, uh, recognition. And the other one is about uh, recontextualize. Uh, so there was a question uh, from one of my former uh, ambassadors uh, from India about language. And uh, also, um, it is not just about language, uh, the word by word, but it's also very much about uh, contextualize it to your own culture, because you need to understand um, the culture and the tradition and the country. And you have seen that extremely uh, visible in this um, lead with this leader uh, French course, for example. So it is so much more. Uh, and also, I would like maybe to uh, to cite um, our colleague uh, Rory McGreal. Uh, because he has a very important point about uh, this is issue, and that is, uh, I mean, can we really uh, have a standard for OER? Because the beauty of OER is that it is uh, moving all the time, so to say, because it is peer-reviewed, it is changed, it is adapted, it is um, uh, maybe rechanged, it is maybe recontextualized, it is maybe, trans- I mean, all these kind of processes. So, um the peer review aspect is very much important because if you, if something is used to a very high extent, then other people would like to, to use it as well. As we do, for example, with TripAdvisor, as we do with Amazon, as we do with um, a lot of those kind of, of um, uh, other sectors outside the institution. Uh, and then there is some kind of embedded standard as well, because I, as a teacher, academic researcher, I have my standards. I don't produce or let something go out, which I'm not satisfied with. Neither with my institution is, um, put the name on it if they are not really satisfied it, about it. And if it is good, not, not, not good enough, uh, no one of you will use it. So then I know it is bad, or maybe I know it is good. So uh, it's some kind of process. So maybe we need more to talk about the, the process of, uh, of developing OER and and. Um, uh, how this uh, can maybe give us our 
guidelines or frameworks. And as uh, you said also, Jacques, we had the, the legal aspects. We have, I mean, we have a lot of frameworks which need to go together, so to say. Um, so again, there's no uh, one size fits all. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Eva. And just just yes, to pick up please, one Alan, final point now, one because yes, I, yes. I I was on IMS when the reading list standard was generated, and I think things like this it's important that we do get some influence into things like IMS because unless you have some minimum codification that allows things to be searchable by different systems, then it means you can never connect something like Canvas or Moodle to search something because all the vendors are using different different systems. So if we need to get a minimum standard in to allow some of that discovery in. And I think that's the challenge that Eva was going to highlight. We need to find some way of a minimalist, let's get these things at least codified so that they can be surfaced. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, Jack, maybe just one last question for you. Uh, Jack has to leave us. Um, so a quick one on the future. What do you see are the developments um, within uh, this uh, open and flexible um, education? What's the most intriguing and exciting developments that you, you think will happen and that will require a multi in collaboration? Oh, well, that's uh, two completely different things. Reconciliation between the people who are traditional proponents of open and distance education and experts and those who just through the pandemic starting doing things on their own and uh, well made emergency distance education which is was not as good as what the theorists were telling them that's on the one one side on the other side but what i've been dreaming for the past 20 years is being about immersed physically in the learning environment so Perhaps so one day I'll be immersed in a 3D technology, having courses, being able to touch the content and manipulate it and uh, get feedback from it. So that's one of my dreams. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, Jacques has, has to leave now. And uh, you can write to, to him on the chat or uh, take contact if you have any questions specific. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Maybe Alan and, and, and Eba, um, do you want to have your uh, uh, answer to, to the future? What do you see as a development? What, what, how do you see that uh, education will evolve and why would it continue needing uh, sectoral collaboration? You go first, Alan. Yeah, I, I said you're a good poker player, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, from what I can see in some of the discussions in the Encore project, I think there's two or three things that are getting quite exciting. One is, I think there's there's a realization that there's people who want this to work, and they're not necessarily people who are engaged with the OER conversations just now. There are people who are. You know, national champions, you know, there's nations trying to promote greater use of OER. So there's government agencies, education groups and whatever, trying to actually actively promote them, which puts a stakeholder in that can help some of that curation and facilitation layer. And also the, you know, people like librarians and their role in assisting, assisting people to both do the curation at the end user point and also play a role within institutions to promote these things. Because ultimately, unless teachers, trainers and facilitators are aware of what's possible, they'll never think about using it. So I think bringing different stakeholders in and seeing that it aligns to their role is an interesting component. And I think that's quite exciting because traditionally it's been OERs over here and end users are over here and there's a bit of a gulf. I think the second thing is people want to share and want to understand how they can share. And I think that's starting to drive some of the conversations around quality badging is not the right word, but how do we surface things so it's got a it's got a value in the open open education resource community, which is useful and that kind of correlates with the technology side around there's a big appetite to somehow 
crosswalk what's there and make it visible to people who so they can easily repurpose. Be it just a student or a member of the public that's looking for something useful or someone within a structured learning activity. So I think there's those three things kicking around. Different stakeholders getting engaged, a, a more motivation to help people get things into the OER community and that helps surface some things. And how do we bring things together to the end user? Thank you. Yeah, so so, um, so uh, I would like uh, to continue then with. Um, I really want would like to see uh, for the future, and then with that I mean uh, the future which started which started yesterday. <coughs> um, that um, we have to really be serious when we are talking about those issues. Uh, so what is the, the real question we are trying to, or real challenges we are trying to solve? And that is the most important. I mean, we can't just talk about OER uh, because it because we like it or because uh, we think it's good. Except what you were saying, Alan, we are a lo uh, bunch of enthusiasts uh, who really understand what it is, but uh, those who really need it uh, maybe uh, don't uh, have the same kind of perspective. So we really need to see what are the real challenges we are trying to solve. And one of the challenges is with uh, the SDG4, which is built by, by human on human rights and the social justice for all people. And when also when the, the recommendation of OER was launched and adopted by all the member states, it was said that um, working with openness and with OER is the only way uh, to reach the goal of the SDG4. Because to, to educate all the people out there who needs qualified education, we need to build one university a day. And that is not uh, feasible, it is not desirable. So the only way is that we need to collaborate on the resources and the competences we have. And this is one way we can do that. So that is what I really would like to see and um, uh, to, to see a very strong and, and serious, um, not just debate because it is really not, uh, now the time to walk the talk and not just to talk about it. And for that, we really need to, as you were saying, Alan, as well, and I think that, that has been very clear during this webinar, that we need to involve all the stakeholders and not at least the, the end users. And also to see the, the whole ecosystem of it, because it is not just about technology. It's not just about um, the five R's. It's not just about that and that. It is really needed to see the ecosystem and to see the full picture. Uh, but most of all, as I also said uh, uh, earlier in one of the when in my introduction, that um, the real challenge is to move outside the institution because it is most of those people outside the institutions, uh, the lifelong learners uh, who who don't who can't afford to go to formal education, who need uh, the openness and who need open qualified resources which they can use for their. Uh, which also UNESCO, the initiative about futures of education. So they, the people can become what they would like to become with all those qualified resources. And also again, what is paid by tax money should go back to the taxpayers and the taxpayers are the people out there. An interesting connection to that. So I, I heard this story last week. So it's a large university in the US, which their dean had a very social inclusion agenda and they're, they're so their big driver, this is how stakeholders can drive things. Their big driver was they felt that their students who were they were bringing in on a social inclusion basis and just the general student community could not afford the textbooks and stuff they were being asked to do. So they had a big agenda to drive to open textbooks and where that was not possible to basically sweat the publishers down so that every student only paid an affordable subscription for all their books. They delivered that. And the uptake of educational resources and student satisfaction went through the roof. So again, it's that who's driving the use. And most, if you look around Europe, most universities, especially post-COVID, now have a big social inclusion agenda. How do we make what we provide as accessible to everybody, both on an affordable basis and accessibility basis as well? So again, I think that's an opportunity that's quite timely for this conversation. It is very timely because uh, so much research has shown. I have myself been involved in several global uh, research studies uh, around the globe with many countries involved and researchers involved. And it has really been shown 
and I think all of you who are in this webinar has been that as well. Um, collaboration uh, and the ways of collaboration has really, really uh, increased. And also, of course, the use of, uh, uh, of open material, open sources, etc. And the culture, I think it is very much a question of culture. And due to uh, to COVID, uh, I mean, in one way fortunate, but uh, COVID is so terrible, so I don't even would like to speak about it. But uh, it has uh, forced us uh, in some directions to have this, uh, to develop some kind of other uh, culture and this culture of collaboration, of sharing, of networking, and also, of course, of um, bringing in, bringing in uh, openness in so many different kind of directions. So just um, keep us going. And um, as I said, the future started yesterday, so we have to just move on. <laughs> And I, th I think, so, sorry, just if I could just tidy up one point from what I was saying, because I think I, we're seeing the same thing from the Encore project. There's different stakeholders now categorize them as two different ones. There's facilitators. Actually, we would like to make this happen. And there's drivers. We need to make this happen. And I think the drivers are the more important ones, because if they're empowered and can have messages to share, we want to do this and this is how we do it, that helps drive everything else. Sorry, Emily. Sometimes I really yeah. need to, to to think to see uh, <clears throat> to see. And I hear, I hear very, very much from my ambassadors, for example, when we, we are meeting, um, and we used to meet each a month, uh, once a month. So we we meet each other quite often to share experiences. And I hear from many countries that also the the drivers are coming from the users in many countries, and that is why things are happening. For example, many countries in Africa. The, the demand are coming from the, from the learners, from the students. And of course, the cost, as you were saying, Alan, is one of the drivers, so to say, because they can't afford it. Uh, maybe in richer countries um, where education is free of charge, uh, as in my own country, for example, it is, um, you know, it is not so, so natural and they're not so strong drivers, maybe. But um, of course, there are different kind of cultures in each country. But um, when, the, when the driving is coming from the users, uh, I think... Um, things is going to happen maybe a bit faster. And what about the teachers? What do you think? Because I, I've seen in the Francophone project, for instance, there, there's been also this discussion about the material that maybe not in COVID, but that sometimes it can be competitive, the OER, the, the, the material that's open. That uh, So, I mean, I think there is a lot to, to advocate for. Um, many different stakeholders, but they're also central yeah. to the educational system. And also another question about what's the role of artificial intelligence in this? Because you're talking about the drivers. I mean, I know the Encore project is also very much about innovation. And we talked about adaptation of OER material. There is also this, this need of advocacy about really how the strong potential of OER for adaptation that can be used, reused, that people can just take it for themselves and adapt it to what their needs. I mean, that's, that's really the, the, the strong potential of, of OER. Uh, but it will take, you say it will take uh, one university to be created a year to, to meet the need of, of, of uh, educational need uh, today in the world. But I mean, to adapt uh, OER, uh, I mean, what's existing, like the question, what is existing, at least for the Procofon project, that's been also a question. I no. think it is, uh, in, it is extremely important what you're saying, Anais, and also what Chuck was saying about um, uh, about uh, AI and um, um, more three-dimensional resources. I mean, all these kind of new things, we, we can't just see or we are as one track in a, uh, in a constantly developing society, so to say, with a lot of technology and digitalization and uh, a lot of other kind of challenges. And also, for example, blockchain and OER goes also very. That is also one one issue when you can track the development of OER resources, for example, using blockchain. And um, that is still a very new area, although we have had both uh, for a very long time. Uh, so that is also a, a new sector, so to say, which we have to dig into. Yeah, and for the new mapping, research. for the creation. I mean, there, there is more and more potential, and I wanted to yeah to ask you about what you thought about the, the potential of AI. Yeah, a lot of potentials. We just have to face it. We just have to do it. <laughs> It, it has, there's a bit of a virtuous circle, but also an unvirtuous circle, because 
I think there is potential for, especially once you understand trends and usage and everything else, but there's also a, a big privacy push as well. So people are actually a bit concerned around how their data is being used to support things. So the, there's a kind of counterbalance to, yes, AI and understanding how people are using things can help shape things around, but also to what extent do people want to actually have that data visible on a on a personal basis but yeah it's it's uh, i think the difficulty is making sure that people because we would see this in a lot of students on how data analytics are used to help them it's it's really working with people to make sure that what's being done is obviously for them and is not being done for some purpose that they don't understand. And again, I think having the community saying, we need a way to help us do this. How can AI help us do that? Almost puts them in the demand driver's seat. And then there is another issue I would like to, to um, take on, um, which is not so often talked about, but it is really um, uh, integrated in the UNESCO OER recommendation. And that is about um, those learners with um, some kind of disabilities, hearing disabilities or sighted disabilities or reading disabilities or whatever. Uh, most, most of the uh, OER, so to say, we have to talk about resources. And that is why I really think, say that we need to go above the resources as such to see the whole ecosystem. But most of the resources are uh, so far in written materials or maybe in images uh, or whatever. <clears throat> um, and also, as was said in one of the, the questions here about the language, is most of them are in, in English and most of them are also produced by um, academics uh, as us, rather high level um, people, uh, qualified people in uh, when it comes to education. But we really need to, to see um, the those um, groups which are vulnerable with uh, some kind of learning uh, problems or disabilities. And I quite often uh, get the question, do we really need to translate our, uh, everything or do we really need have to have everything by text, for example? Or some kind of, um, if something is on text, do we need to have a video as well? Yes, if you go to the recommendation, it is actually there that the resources should be, be uh, offered and uh, delivered in different kind of media. So yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> and it's true that AI gives the, that opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, some of our members, for instance, the uh, University of Merrick uh, has this very specific uh, lab on OER, uh, on artificial intelligence, and they're working with the um, material that can help uh, children with autism, for instance, uh, with specific images that can help with the concentration. I mean, that's also a big potential, it's true. Uh, and that's uh, just the beginning. <laughs> And that is also why we need to go out even outside the institutions, because of course we have many students with different kind of problems, as we have been told. I mean, learning problems or reading problems or sight problems or whatever. But all those people out there maybe have even more problems. Or different and kinds. very interesting to follow the the new uh, recommendations that have been worked on right now. The recommendation on open science, and which yes. uh, one of the members of the advocacy committee actually is very involved, and Uncle Chris. <laughs> And there is both actually, uh, Daniel Burgos, which is fine that for ICDE, and, and also the UNESCO recommendation on open science and the UNESCO recommendation on ethics in artificial intelligence, yeah. because all these topics are in the conversation. I think it's going to be very interesting. Yes, and uh, adding to that, that, that is also why we need, really need to see the ecosystem and see the whole um, ecosystem of, system of openness, because it is it goes uh, together. And as you are saying, with the open science, with the... Um, uh, ethics and um, I mean all the the other open movements actually that was stressed very much in the in the um, uh, Cape Town open education declaration the Stanford University ordered in 2017 the importance of seeing OER together with other movements about open education mm -hmm. so that is also maybe for the future which started to yesterday that we need to go back to that yes does anyone of you want to give a few closing words. I think we're approaching now the end of this session. 
I think all my my short summary would be: there's an appetite for change, and there's an opportunity for change. So now is the time to get involved. There's there's things happening just now, and probably it's probably only the next eighteen months because if things don't change in the next eighteen months, we may just slip back to where we were. Mm-hmm. So there there is a chance to do things. So there's there's projects involved here, and there's other activities going on now. If you're if you're interested in this area, now is a chance to make a difference. I also would like to add to that that uh, maybe no one can do everything, but all of us can do something. So be involved and um, be in advocate what you believe in and uh, be in the be active in the movement. Movement. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everyone, uh, for participating. Follow uh, the news, the newsletter. Get involved in the projects. Uh, follow what the OER advocacy committee is doing. Uh, all the speakers, uh, actors that talk today are very active uh, in open education because I can go further than OER. And, and so thank you so much for, for uh, presenting, for participating in the panel, for participating in the, in the session. And uh, let's meet again <laughs> in the project or in the community. I'll be very happy to, to cross paths again. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much for... Um for the opportunity and uh, let's walk uh, the path together yeah thank you very much thank you bye bye